just going. Because that one's still going, isn't it? That's still just going. Just look around the viewer base. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You, you know, I even recognize all the years of my religious training development from being a very small child. We're not translating it. No. Is, is how I've held the illusion of that. I've held of, uh, of your crucifixion and the time and the significance and why and divine and blood. It's like I've been part of the suffering by holding the illusion. Yeah, the, this is the sad, the sad thing about um, the the sad thing about uh, most of what's been going on on the planet with regard to religious belief is that even people who say they do not believe in these underlying Christian ideals um, actually have a lot of affinity to them emotionally. So, for example, this whole concept that somebody sacrificed their life for you is a very emotional concept. And, in fact, if somebody did sacrifice their life for you, you would obviously feel very emotional about the fact that they've taken that decision, uh, which would obviously be a, potentially a decision made because they loved you. And as a result, it triggers all sorts of emotions inside the person. This, of course, then, makes the person open to this concept that God created a sacrifice for the whole world. Right. And so this underlying emotional injury that, that where, where we honour a person who loves us, who, who sacrifices their life for us, causes us then to think that God created a person, Jesus, who then is going to sacrifice his life for all of humanity. And, and we become addicted to these concepts because of the underlying emotional injury. It reminds me of the movie The Matrix, you know, where there's a big matrix going on that's a complete illusion, mm -hmm. yeah. right? But we're all invested in the matrix, yeah. and, and I'm holding the matrix, yeah. right, by my own belief systems. Yeah. Yeah. That's right, and you're supporting the matrix through right. your belief systems. Yeah. Right. And doesn't that create guilt in all relationships? It, it, I, I think it creates many more things than just guilt. You know, first, firstly, it panders to people's sadness. Mm -hmm. um, and so therefore it gives the illusion that when a person is sad and crying about something that is significant, that it actually means that they are growing. When the reality is, oftentimes we cry about things that are not even real. They are just figments of our own imagination. So, so there are many people on the planet who are Christians, for example, who cry and feel guilty about my so-called mm -hmm. uh, sacrifice for their sin. And in fact, many of them are made to feel guilty every weekend mm -hmm. for the sacrifice of, you know, that I gave for their sin, when the reality is I can't sacrifice anything for their sin. They will have to pay the penalty of their own sin one way or another sometime in the future. And so the, the sad thing about it, I feel, is that it gives these, all of these uh, illusions to belief systems as well. So th these belief systems become real only because millions of people have an emotional connection to them. This is how belief systems become real, in fact. By being, they get created by emotions within the person that are unhealed. When these emotions give birth to a creation, they give birth to concepts or intellectual ideas that are religious in nature about God, the universe and everything around us that are all false. And then, because we have this emotional investment in the belief, we support the belief for the rest of our life, we teach the belief to our child, and because we have also taught our child the same emotional injury, the child readily accepts the emotional belief, and then we have the perpetuation of false beliefs for, it, for as long as it takes for somebody to go, well, well maybe, maybe we shouldn't have this belief. Well, then it's supported by the level six magnitude of the projection of the spirits to create spiritual events that now motivate religions and addict people into certain processes. Exactly. There are many religious movements Very in strong. the spirit world that are addicted to maintaining the illusion of their movement on earth because if, if you can get a person on earth to believe it, there's a high likelihood they will believe it all the way through their life on earth and all the way through their life in the spirit world until they reach the sixth dimension. Unfortunately, they're never going to be able to go beyond the sixth dimension mm -hmm. while they retain it. Well, Buddhism and Hinduism and others, there's so many. So yes. as, as you said before, when they're in the sixth and they want to go to the seventh, they, they're going to have to come down to 
Feel emotions that they skipped over? Not only feel emotions they've skipped over, but also to release belief systems that they still have retained that, that are more in harmony with natural love, but completely out of harmony with divine love. So they're going to have to work their way through all of those belief systems as well. And, so it, and, and it creates a huge lag on the soul in the sense that the soul who, who has imbibed all of these belief systems finds it very hard to give them up, very difficult process to give them up and, and, and then allow themselves to absorb a new belief system. And, and you, if you look at the average person on earth who is in a religious, some kind of religious system, how difficult it is for them to actually leave the belief even after they leave the religion, many times they still retain the belief. Yes. Emotionally. Yeah. Emotionally retain yeah. the belief. Could these be called spiritual addictions? Yes, uh, the world is full of spiritual addictions, but every spiritual addiction always pacifies a certain emotion. Mm -hmm. So, for example, this belief that um, I died for everyone's sins, can you see the emotions that it pacifies? It means that every person doesn't have to take responsibility for their life mm -hmm. because somebody else died for them. Right? So straight away it's taking away the responsibility of the individual and placing it on one person. And also that they're less. Also they that they're power less. To yes. do it themselves. They're being taught that I am different than they. They're being taught that I'm greater than them. And this is why eventually they all started to believe that I was God. Mm -hmm. You know, they believed that I was so greater than them that I became God. And I've never been God, I will never be God, and, and the reality is I am the same as any other person who's able to develop. And so, you know, all of these false beliefs cause more problems and more problems and more problems, and when they pass over in the spirit world, they don't all disappear. They all are retained, most of them, and then they continue to cause problems in the spirit world. So to explain why being in the body now is so developmental as compared to being in the spirit world, teaching the spirits not to do this. And yes, the, when you are a spirit who is of high development in love, it is very, very difficult to come to a location that's in a low development of love and share some of the experience of how you became a high spirit. Does that make sense? Yes. The reason why it's difficult is because a person looks at you and they go, but you're totally different than I am. So they remember the spirits on Sunday, yes. how they said, these spirits look like different creatures to us. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Was that in that channel? Yeah, yeah. it was on it was Sunday. Like Gloria. The Gloria, yeah. Gloria said, but this spirit, the woman spirits in front of me, they don't look like they're the same creature to they're us. They're playing and having fun and they're young. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Right. So they're not even the same kind of, maybe they're some kind of other creature or some, and, and this is the problem is the lower spirits in the spirit world, the ones who are less developed in love, find it difficult to communicate with the spirits that are higher, more developed in love, because they can't go to the location of the higher spirit, and the higher spirit must come to their location in order to talk. And in coming to their location, the lower spirit never gets to see the higher spirit in its true location. In addition, the lower spirit believes the higher spirit to be a different creature. And so therefore somebody with, to whom they should not listen. And, or, they're or they're afraid of listening yeah. to. Or they feel unworthy of listening to. And as a result, many lower spirits will not listen at all to any higher spirit. What was remarkable that Gloria, who seemed you know, really benevolent in her intentions and her group, had no idea that anything else existed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, amazing. And she and only knew of the first dimension that she existed in, in the spirit world, and the earth. That's all she knew. You didn't say. Well, that's another reason why it's so powerful to be here. Like, the irony is so much of the like, so much of our earth is controlled by spirit world, uh, by the influence of spirits. In the first dimension in particular. In the first dimension, yeah. But because those spirits in that first dimension have such a strong resonance still with their earth, life they're often observing here they feel more connected to thing to people here because their emotional condition is really similar so then if you have someone here sort of turning back and teaching them something mm. it's far more powerful than someone trying oh, to reach yeah, them yeah. from a higher space if if someone here is telling them hey there's a different truth or there's something else to acknowledge 
very often they're more open emotionally because there's more resonance with this life experience here because they've only they haven't shifted much really emotionally um, and they're really much the same as they were on earth yeah they have exactly the same beliefs they had on earth 300 years 300 yeah. years they're still much wow. the same person yeah. They, they still have the same understandings. They haven't discovered anything about spirit. So really they're like an earth dweller living in the spirit world. Mm. And so when you talk to them from the earth, it's very much more simple to communicate with them and, and easy, easily to motivate them in comparison to... They believe they're being loving. Yeah. Mm. And that's that thing we were saying earlier, that the, the biggest problems that you have are the things where you believe, believe you're loving and you're actually not. Because you, you just, it's so hard to become aware of those things because you have the false belief, what I'm doing is actually good. And unless someone really pointedly says, it's not and this is why. And you, you get can, to the point of feeling it. Yeah, mm. then you can stay in that state for years and years and years, as, like, as each of us know from our own life. Hey? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So this whole, the, whole con the, the beauty of coming to the earth is that you have the ability to communicate not only with people on earth easily because it's very hard for a celestial spirit to communicate with people on earth because the people on earth have very different belief systems to a celestial spirit but not only that you can communicate now to people on earth through a face-to-face -face exchange which obviously is much more simple than trying to do it via ideas and concepts that enter the soul and, and enter the mind but secondly you now have the ability to communicate with the lower spirits in a much more uh, present manner mm -hmm. and they can actually see and you can take them through and handhold them through a process which would be very difficult to handhold them through if you were a celestial spirit. Mm -hmm. you know, one of the feelings I got when you were talking was I recognized that the, the diameter of my belief systems about all the constructs of religions and all were vastly interwoven illusions of which I grew up with mm -hmm. but you're describing the you know the simplicity of your love of God and the sharing of your soul mate as really a really well I'm saying it's small but it's pure in its actual embodiment mm -hmm. as opposed to the complexity of the vast illusion <laughs> yes yeah the man loves complexity the reason why man loves complexity is it makes him feel clever and the reason why he needs to be made to feel clever is because he actually doesn't feel very clever at all mm -hmm. and he wants the illusion of being clever. And of course, so what he does then is he creates a whole heap of intellectual concepts and ideas that makes him feel clever when in reality it just it, it, it demonstrates how addicted he is to the illusion of being clever. Yeah, and actually when you understand that very pure, simple truth, you have the framework to understand absolutely absolutely everything else in its complexity mm. but because mankind has missed so long the point like that simple truth then they have to create all of these other ways of describing all of these other things that they see and it becomes really complex and in like yeah but what do you call that complex I doesn't that a result of yeah. being self-reliant when they didn't absorb the truth anymore they had to find out what the truth was and then they were yes. misguided is a complete result of self-reliance, but not only self-reliance, it's the ability of the human person to construct an illusion that he then believes is reality. This is how we avoid our emotions. What we do in the process of avoiding our emotions, what we finish up doing is we construct illusions, we construct things that are not true in order to avoid what is true. And, and this is how we go about constructing illusions that are not reality. And the more illusion we construct, the more and the more intellectual we become, the more we believe our own constructions. Mm -hmm. That is the sad fact. And the more we believe them, the more we live them. And therefore, the more they become reality. So, so in the end, we finish up constructing, uh, and it, because of a denied emotion, we construct an illusion of beliefs we then live those beliefs, which then support our denied emotion, but unfortunately add to our denied emotion and make the, it even greater and more intense, which then supports the illusion even further. And in the end, we have become so far removed from the beginning of the process that we believe the life we live now is reality. So almost every person on this planet currently 
believes the life they are living is real. From God's perspective, it is so far removed from real as to be a laugh. Right. But the reality is that we have chosen this course of action in our own addiction to our own intelligence. So, so we are addicted to feeling intelligent rather than being intelligent. If we were intelligent beings, there would be no war on this planet. If we were intelligent beings, there would be no war. Nobody could support it. If we were intelligent beings, there would be no starvation on this planet. Nobody could support it. But we are not intelligent beings. So what we do is we create an illusion. And we even create a whole set of belief systems. For instance, this belief system, there has to be good and there has to be bad. Otherwise, you wouldn't see the good. If there was no bad, you wouldn't see the good. So we create that belief system so that we justify the badness. Right? The badness that we created in the first instance. Uh -huh. and, and these are all very, very damaging processes that we engage and, and, and unfortunately mislead us tremendously away from what God's truth is and what God's love would, would dictate for us to do if we accepted it. Where does pride come from? Because we're proud of this. And um, pride always comes from some, some, some of the other opposite emotions. For example, pride comes from unworthiness or feelings that I am not good enough. And so what we do is we deny these feelings we're not good enough. So from that moment on, we have to prove to ourselves that we are good enough. And as soon as we go down that track, we start creating constructs that are totally unbelievable to, the, to, a, to a normal reasoning person. But we will believe they are true in order to support the fact that we have some kind of we have some kind of worth that we really don't believe we have anyway. And so you will find every single emotion that is out of harmony with humility has been constructed to support a set of beliefs that help us avoid the underlying hurt emotion. And this is the case with the, with society everywhere on this planet. Every society has done the same thing. Of course every society has different uh, underlying, um, what you call underlying emotional feelings, mm -hmm. but the reality is that each society do create specific and unique constructs. Mm -hmm. And this is why the Brazilian society is different to the North American society, and that's different to the European society, and that's different to life in Australia, and that's different to life in Africa. But at the end of the day we're all doing the same thing in a different area. Does it have to do with how the, the country was colonized by the first people that came there, what happened? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Very much so. Here. Yeah. Very much yeah. so. Yeah. It, it, a lot of these constructs that are created in, in all societies are the result of what has happened to the society. So, so, for example, if the society has been involved in a war, it's going to have a very different uh, feelings than if the society has been involved in a slow change, a slow peaceful change very different feelings that will then be imposed upon the society itself. And, and in the end, um, all of these things that happen are all out of harmony with love, the majority of them. And I'm not saying that all society is unloving because, because there are many loving things that happen in the course of a single day. But if we look at the illusionary constructions that, that we make in order to feel pri pride in ourselves, yeah. all of those particular things generally are related to unloving uh, things that are related to our own fears and as a result they all result in further grief and suffering to mankind. So, so everything that we make here like cars, it creates pollution, and we, we have a loving desire but it's not totally loving because the, the result it will be unloving. Exactly. Almost everything. We're willing exactly. to um, Compromise. Compromise. To sacrifice a loving principle in order to get what we want. And the mm. minute we do that, it's, it's going to be damaging to not just us, but a lot of different... The environment, other people. See, once mankind really learns different. to never compromise love, never compromise truth, no matter what they do, then everything we create will be in harmony with love and truth. Mm. Everything. We were talking this morning about arms manufacture and... AJ was saying, unfortunately, so much of scientific development has been led through the industry of arms manufacture. So just that alone is going to have a limiting uh, effect on how much... Also, where are they going to find out? Exactly, exactly. what the they're going to find out. Because yeah. the goal is an unloving goal before it began. Yeah. Yeah. So of course they're going to be limited. 
You know, why, why is mankind struggling with nuclear fusion and nuclear fission? Like, fission is fine, you know, we're happy to create an atomic weapon that blows everybody up. But what about some nuclear fusion that creates energy for free? But what about that? Why is mankind struggling uh. to discover the truth of it? Mm. The reason why is because he's not motivated by a loving desire. And of course, if you're not motivated by a loving desire and you haven't received, you can't mm. receive inspiration from God on the issue, you're only going to receive information, inspiration from other people who are also motivated by an unloving desire, and their understanding is going to be far more limited than God's. They want to know this so they can make a lot of money. Or they want to have a way of uh, charging more energy yeah. to people yeah. even though it's free for production. In other words, they want to have more profit. Yeah. Or they want to have more control. They want to have a centralized source of control. You know, there are, there are possible nuclear fusion techniques that available where you could put it in a little box and power a city. And yet these are never going to become available on this planet under the current way that people think because everybody wants to be able to charge something or get something from it or you know, greed is the underlying motivator. And while greed is the underlying motivator, of course we're not going to discover the things we need to discover. We're going to actually stop people who are not motivated by greed. We're going to make it hard for the people not motivated by greed. If our whole world changed and we decided, okay, everything is going to be in harmony with truth and love, not, no longer greed will be the motivator. No longer will we destroy the earth that we live in because we understand that it's our home. No longer will we destroy people around us. We're going to focus on these things first. Then, very rapidly, scientific truth will come to us in abundance. And as a result, our society will change. It will become a more developed society and, and also... Everybody in the society will, will be able to function and survive and have, have an abundance without having the destruction of anything. But only possible when we do not compromise truth and love. But we're taught from the moment we're born to compromise truth and love. Wasn't there a time that uh, humanity started discovering a lot of stuff and then it kind of slows, slowed down? They're not discovering that much anymore. Maybe it was after the, the Second World War and then people probably felt really bad about what happened and were more loving and they started creating stuff. But nothing's happening now. Yes. It's just simple things. Yeah. And there is a strong desire in mankind to not know more if they have to become more loving. They're invested in their current addictions. Yeah, they lifestyle. don't want to become more loving and as a result that precludes them from discovering more. So, mm. Mm. all right then. The, the mutual and simultaneous love of God, right? And this is the love of God that increases the divine love within both of you. Shared in the, in the shared passion of your desire to serve that you share your passion together to serve mm -hmm. is, is the means by which you can stay in the presence of the love of God because you love to explain it, mm -hmm. right? You love to do your work, right? Yeah. You love to do your passion and mm -hmm. thus you're circulating and growing because you are sharing it all the time. Yeah. I want this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like the way you do this. Yeah. Yeah. It feels really good to watch you do it. Yeah. There's no, it's beautiful having like yourself and the other half of yourself in harmony with each other, in harmony with all of your desires. And, and doing it together. And, yeah. yeah, and of course you're going to do it together when you do that. Yeah. And, um, but we see for a lot of people, they're so afraid of, um, they're so afraid of each other, mm -hmm. like, you know. The male wants to have domination over the female. The female wants to have safety from the male and control him. And all of these things happen. And as soon as those things start happening, then, of course, there's a distortion of desire. Mm -hmm. And as soon as there's a distortion of desire, you cannot achieve anywhere near what you could achieve if there was some cooperation. Yeah. The simplicity of that discussion to me seems very significant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to see that uh, you two are different and the same at the same time. Hmm. There are moments that AJ speaks certain subjects and then you go into other kind, you know, other yeah. levels. It's different. Mm -hmm. It's like the feminine and the masculine. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and and I think as I open to myself more, you know, I'm really still um, grappling with a lot of just the bigness, I suppose, of, of our desire. I often want to mm-hmm. squash it into something that I feel is manageable for me, that I'm not so afraid of. The more that I'm open to that, I feel like femininity comes more from me. Um, and the more I suppose I work through different issues, judgments I have around my own femininity. But yeah, I feel that that happens more. Do you agree with that? that mm. Yeah, that um, because when I met AJ, I felt in competition with him because I had all these injuries and and I and I wanted to be as good as him in every way, but I also didn't want to embrace everything that he'd embraced in terms of identity and emotion and everything. But the more I just embrace myself and experience the fear that I have about the bigness of everything, the more I feel content to be me. And that's when I have people say to me, wow, I feel something different coming from you. It's not that you're saying something different, it's a different quality. Mm. And quite often uh, what I find is that um, we both have the same concept in our soul. So it's one soul and we both have the same concept. But the feminine way of looking at things is different than the masculine way of looking at things. And that is a part of femininity and masculinity. There are differences in the way that you see some things. If, if I honour the feminine part of myself, mm. and the feminine part of myself honours the masculine part of myself, then we're not going to see these two things as being in opposition to each other, but rather we're going to see them as being an assistance to each other. Mm. Right? What I notice happens in most relationships is that, is that the woman sees what the man's saying in, is to be in opposition to what she feels, and well, the man the sees man, the yeah. woman's feelings as being in opposition to his logic. Yeah. And as a result of that, they have now s- created more separation between each other. Whereas, like, I enjoy seeing Mary embrace her femininity and her feelings, uh, just as she enjoys me embracing my masculinity and my logic. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? And I have feelings, uh, as, as do all souls, uh, as, as does Mary. And Mary has logic, as do, as do all souls. But obviously some, there are some parts that are more masculine traits than others and there are some parts that are more feminine in that nature to others. When you honour it in the other, now you can grow together. When you are trying to pull it down or, or, or um, damage it in the other, now there is no opportunity for growth of both of you. Yeah, but this is what I feel I see happening in many relationships. Is like, there's the two halves. They think they want to get closer, and they think they want to progress. But in reality, what they're doing is this one's pulling this one down. So he pulls her down. She now, now that she's feeling down, wants to pull him down. And he, now that he's even worse, wants to pull her down. And both of them don't want to feel their feelings about what's happening. And so eventually they get pulled down and pulled down and pulled down. They stay together for other reasons. Sometimes it's sex and sometimes it's for other purposes, security and so forth. But in reality, they haven't gone anywhere but down. Mm. You know, they haven't progressed. They haven't, they haven't made any major inroads in their relationship. Their sexual bond is, is, is still the same distance, you know, or, or worse than it was when they began their relationship and so forth. For good reason, because they're constantly in opposition to each other. Now, when you're to a couple and you're working in the positive direction towards each other and towards God, you don't pull each other down like this. You support each other, but you do not support the unloving desires in the other or the untruthful desires in the other. You don't support them at all. In fact, you constantly confront them. So, so as this person gets up, this person confronts the unloving desires in this person. Now, this person, if she or he is humble is going to respond to that confrontation in a positive direction and release the reasons why they are unloving and then they will be in a position where they might confront things in this person and this person then because they're humble and, and because they have a desire for God and a desire to get closer they release the particular things that are in their soul that cause you know, the, the, the feelings that are negative from the confrontation and you get this <laughs> right, you get this growing process that occurs where the two are coming together, they're working towards God and truth and love, and, and they're not, this, their, their soul isn't degrading and their love between each other isn't degrading, it's, 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 enhanced, it's being enhanced, it's growing. So many couples 
they work apart, right? All day long, mm -hmm. they have a few minutes of breakfast, they go off, maybe they come back for a meal, maybe they don't. In the evening, they come back for an hour, relate to the kids, go to bed, do it again. Yeah. yeah. And I feel most couples live that life by choice because they can't bear each other constantly. Mm. And the reason why they can't bear each other constantly is because they're not humble enough to feel the injuries of, of themselves or the other and actually work in harmony with love and truth to confront those particular things. So what they like doing is working apart. Like, why would you like working apart if you really love somebody and right. you wanted to be with them and you were enjoying your life with them and you enjoyed your sexual union? And, you know, why would you want more time apart? Right. I, I, I just do not understand this concept of people wanting time apart. By the time they're older, they retire and they're, they're apart in the house. Yeah. yeah. Right, and yeah. they're worried about the kids. Yeah. And yeah. all the kids have gone, maybe, and everything else, and then they left, what do I do now? You know, we, the two halves, are like, uh, in some cases, like strangers. They sleep in separate rooms. And they sleep in separate rooms, and, and they just stay together because it's convenient, and to break up would mean there'd be a lack of security economically. And, I hear and, it all the time. And so that's what they do. And, and the reality is that it all gets constructed way, way before then. There's uh, a belief in Brazil. It's like a recipe for a good relationship not to live together, not see each other very much, just travel and have fun, just mm -hmm. the good moments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No triggering at all. And everybody's, more and more people are saying that that's the best thing to do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't want to be challenged emotionally. <laughs> it's another example of another illusion being created from an unhealed emotion. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing. The reality is you can have a fantastic time together, doing things together all the time. Myself and Mary have very little time apart in our lives. And um, yeah. and we love it. Yeah, and it just gets better. That's the thing that I... That's, we were laughing about that in Barbados, hey? Mm -hmm. like, and I always tell people this analogy that... Most people start, they meet, they're like, wow, we're so in love, this is fantastic, this is forever. They want to be together all the time. They want to be together all the time. And then gradually, you know, it gets a bit triggering, the sex life drops off, they go, oh, it's just not the same as in the beginning, but we love each other. And so then they get married and then they start living this life you're talking about, Denny, where gradually children. over years, they come, the children bond them and then the children leave and then it's like, you know, they're 60, 70 and they kind of feel... And the no children have this example of how to live life, right? This is how you do it. Exactly, and then the kids go, well, that's what it's all about. And I always joke that when I met AJ, it was so challenging for me, like I shared with you last night. It was It was like we started, like the two We started the 70-year-olds, <laughs> and as time goes on, it just... We, not it, much we, attraction, not much desire, not much... Exactly, mm. exactly. And as time goes on, it's like we get closer, and it's, ah, oh, it's better this week than it was last week, and it's better, and it's better, and... Nice. If you just keep embracing those principles, which is why we're so passionate about them, mm. it really works and it's, it becomes more and more beautiful. So, mm. you know, we'll end up in the, the mad passionate of affair. So in, in the beginning... <laughs> Forever. <laughs> Forever, <laughs> exactly. And in the beginning, of course, we have a memory of that state, yeah. so it makes it a bit easier yeah. perhaps. But, but in the beginning, when we met this time, it was like, you know, we spent a few, a few, uh, well, a few days together and then it was like <laughs> apart and then, and then, you know, we spent three months apart and then it was two months apart and then it's one month apart and then it's, and then it's a few days apart. And, and now, it was really me working through a lot of those injuries that you kind of, that cause you to develop that lifestyle of, I've got to be like independent and if I'm with you, then it'll, I won't have a life, it'll all be... You know, all these false beliefs I had about what it means to actually join with a partner, it means you're giving up something instead of gaining something. Mm. And I had to work through those errors mm. to really feel, oh, that's not what's happening here. It's actually love being offered, not yeah. something being taken from me. Yeah, and you yeah. also had to work through this idea or concept that um, you had to work out, didn't you, what you desired for yourself. Yeah. And And... And then you started realising what you desired for yourself was the same thing <laughs> yeah. I desired for myself and yeah. we could do it together. Yeah. Whereas, whereas, and that's the thing with soulmates is because the desires, once they're purified, will be very similar to each other. It's so, why wouldn't you do things together? Mm. You, just, you just don't do anything apart. Why would you want to do it apart? 
yeah. when you could do it together and you could do it together more powerfully and you can enjoy the process together while you're doing it and exactly and my idea of a relationship was actually feel what the other person wants and try to do that more that would create your closeness so actually deny yourself and that it was so shocking AJ kept saying be yourself do what you want you what do you what do you feel what do you feel what and, do you want? Yeah. and then I had to go through this huge process of connecting to what is who we what do I want and then I realized oh my gosh I want the same thing as you <laughs> yeah even though she'd been fighting it up until exactly. then exactly yeah. yeah. so the the difference between your previous life and this one is is really it's the continuation of the same thing you were demonstrating it then and you're showing us now the same thing yeah there are quite a lot of differences between our life in the first century and this one and um, this one is more um, our life in the first century by nature was a bit uh, was different because because of the environment in which we lived at that time you know obviously women at that time were almost they were treated as possessions they weren't in fact they were treated as lower than animals in most cases uh, men basically believed that women were their possessions that they could use whenever they wished to and, and in, fact, for, in fact, for that reason, there was really not a concept of rape or any of those kind of things. You know, it, it was like most women accepted that they were going to be raped or, or abused sexually in some po point in their lives. And most of the men sort of viewed it as a normal occurrence. That's how you kept your life, wife in line or, you know, your many wives in line. Um, and, you know, so the first century life, we, we came into that and tried to demonstrate love in this one-on-one -on -one union. And obviously, um, I reached a condition of one with God. Mary reached a third sphere condition while she was on earth, uh, around about. And, um, and that was a very different... Uh, that had a huge effect on people on the earth in the first century, of course. And it was also the first time someone became a one with God on earth. So that was like a, a milestone or in history, in human consciousness, I suppose you could say, in itself. Whereas that's already ha that's still already happened. And there's and only but there's only one person who's ever been at one with God on Earth, and it was a male. There needs to now be many people at one with God on Earth to see you simultaneously at one. Would exactly, be, mm. exactly. That's what there needs to be. And one of the main reasons for returning is to try and demonstrate that if we're able, uh, rather than to um, you know ra rather than to, you know, our primary reason for returning uh, are actually to demonstrate a lot of things, not necessarily tell, talk about divine truth. Mm -hmm. uh, it's to actually physically demonstrate the divine truth in operation. Um, but of course, in doing that, one of our yeah, desires yeah. is to talk about it so, and to share how to, how to do that with others. But um, we, feel that, we feel that if Mary becomes a one with God, I become a one with God, and then we actually go through this process of unifying our soul like we had have done in the spirit world already and we will come together very rapidly and people will see what a true relationship is as God intended it to be in addition if we have children then people will see what what it's like to bring up a child without any emotional injury and these are very powerful things that you can teach about family um, once you're in the right condition to teach them so the goal is to get in the right condition first and then yeah. So you guys are planning on having children when you are in the higher state? I suspect, yeah, I feel quite strongly we will probably finish up having children. Hmm. Um, but we both want to pretty much wait until we're at one with God, or at least until one of us is. Yeah. Um, yeah. At the speed that you were going, both of you, how, how many years do you think it takes for a person that, just like as yourself, to reach the eighth sphere, to be at one with God? Oh, Adrian. Just if you ask me today, it's like a decade. <laughs> I feel pretty well, decade's today. not that bad, ten years. <laughs> well, in the what first century, thinking? from the time I became uh, really conscious of what was happening, like, and also began to have to accept who I was, it took 13 years. So, so if it takes 13 years this time, I wouldn't be... Uh, you know, I wouldn't be sad about that. I think that's pretty good. Mm. Um, and but then you even had like some, you know, God helped remove some of the injury. So yeah, but I had it, to make a lot of choice to feel a lot of negative emotion as well. But so, I was just going to say though, yeah. if 
if it took longer, it still wouldn't be a long time. Exactly. Yeah. So my, my feelings are once a person positively engages it in an active manner and understands the principles of development of their soul, then then it would surprise me a lot if people doing that today wouldn't be at one we've got in ten years' time. And um, and then of course the next person's doing it would find it much easier. Mm. Exactly. So when the two of you do it unified and we can experience it and feel it, I mean, it's just automatically, oh, uh, wow. That's what I want. Yes. You know, is what people would say. Yes. And then once they have a strong desire for that, they'll stop, they'll stop going, oh, I've got to go to work today, you know, or I've got to, you know, they'll start focusing their entire life on following their desires and passions and, and doing this first thing that they want, which is becoming at one with God and becoming at one with their soulmate. And, and every other pursuit will become secondary to that. Mm. Right. And once that occurs, then you have millions of people on the planet, you know, becoming at one with God very rapidly. Uh, once they understand that they can exercise this desire in a very uh, strong, direct manner. Mm. Mm. And it, obviously it becomes easier for each person that goes behind, not just for that motivational reason, but because at the moment it's like, like AJ's the only soul on earth at present who has who has soul knowledge like experience in his soul in your experience you knowledge of certain truths everyone else is buying a big error around it and then but then just even me coming behind him it's easier for me than it was for him to receive that truth because there's there's like a parting of the yeah. injuries and the more people who receive certain truths the easier it is for other people to be open to them because at the moment it's like this big collective no thanks we don't believe that going towards everyone else's soul and the more people open to new truth the, the easier it is obviously to mm. receive is it harder for you coming from 36 to 1 than it is somebody in 1 coming to 8 yes very much so for a number of reasons. One of them AJ spoke about last night, the yes. psychological right. issues. But also there's the issue of the loss of God, the loss of union. For someone in their first incarnation, they're learning about God and learning about the possibilities of that relationship. But when there's no feelings of loss or grief, no grief associated with the loss of it. Um, the, but when you have experienced it to such a full degree, the feeling of loss is perhaps the biggest feeling. Is this the function of a learning center? Um, yes, yeah, so I, I suppose you could say it is. Um, the learning centers, of, of, I'll give you a document, Danny, actually, which sort of outlines in one and a half pages the basic functions of the learning center. But the basic functions of the learning center is to teach four principles um, in practice, not, not in theory. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to engage pro processes or projects to teach it in practice, day-to-day -day living projects. I'm not talking about, you know, some kind of, everybody sits there and goes, mm, you know, <laughs> and we all become at one with God that way, because that's not the way you become at one with God, actually. You become at one with God by living your life, not through meditation, mm. not through, you know, some, ritual some or, kind of ritual. Yeah. And, and, but by refining the love, you know, allowing God through the law of attraction to bring you events that... It's meant to matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's going to require a process that you experience. And the learning centres, what we would like the learning centres to be, is like a centre of learning for divine truth, number one, and divine truth in four primary principles. The first principle is, if you seek first God's love, all other things will be added to you. So that's the first principle. We want to have the learning centres and everybody who is associated with the learning centres, the learning teams and the projects that are engaged, are all about seeking first God's love and then all of these other things being added to you. And then we also want to, the second principle is the truth will set you free. Divine truth will set you free. In other words, if we discover God's truth, we, we give up this concept of man's truth, because the reality is man's come up with lots of ideas, they believe are true, but, but as you can see in the world around us, the effect of them hasn't been very positive. So we give up the idea of man's truth and, and the Learning Centre Everybody on the Learning Centre or who's a part of the Learning Centre activities is involved in trying to discover more of God's truth. The third thing is about um, uh, ethics, moral, moral ethics. So 
the principle, do unto others what you would love them to do unto you. Right? So this is a very, very important principle. So if you don't like other people being angry with you, why are you angry with them? Right? So there's a moral issue there. So what we want to do is teach that in a very strong manner in the centres. So whenever anybody is out of harmony with that, we point out to them that they're out of harmony with that and they have to go away and deal with why they're out of harmony before they come back. Right? And fourth is this whole thing that I said in the first century that the meek shall inherit the earth or the humble shall inherit the earth. We want to demonstrate the, the importance of humility in day-to-day -day activity in regards to learning and the importance of having an open mind and an open heart rather than one that is already determined and through its own pride already believes itself to know the truth. And those are the four main principles we want to see the learning centres run by. Those four principles. And there's a lot of practical things that we've outlined on this outline to, to engage that process. But in the end, everything that's engaged, any construction that is done, any work that is done on the environment, any planting that is done, any activities with the other people that are done, are all focused on those four primary points. Demonstrating and learning those principles. Yeah, and that's the point of the learning center. How do you exist or live in that world while simultaneously driving a car that you know it's polluting? How do you, how do you mm. exist in these duality worlds where you really want to defy the system? Mm -hmm. Uh, it's very easy actually, because you, you first understand that my heart has to change before anything else can understand, uh, before anything else can change. So man is addicted to changing his environment before he changes his heart. You understand what I mean by that? So in other words, there are many people on the planet who are searching for non-polluting ways to drive their car, while at the same time they are yelling and screaming at their wife. Right? Mm. Now, which one is damaging their soul more? Driving a polluting car or yelling and screaming at their wife? Well, I would say yelling and screaming at their wife is damaging their soul more. And, and so, until he stops yelling and screaming at his wife, his other activity in trying to design a non-polluting car is actually pointless in terms of man's the man's development, his personal development. So what I would suggest to do instead is this. Give up trying to change our environment first and change your heart first. Focus on changing your heart. As your heart changes, you will automatically embrace more loving things. For example, as your heart changes with love, you will no longer want to kill animals. As a result, you will no longer eat meat. As a result, there will be far less devastation on the planet. Like half of your rainforest is, 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 has been devastated because of beef production, cattle production, because of meat, people eating meat, right? And so, so, the reason, so if we all gave up eating meat, can you see there'd be no devastation to the environment? There'd be no demand for meat. If there's no demand, then all the meat farmers would go to producing vegetables <laughs> or some other activity. Um, but you're saying that you have to change your heart. But if I, I have to change my heart to do that. I can't just go, oh, I'll stop eating meat while I still have a desire to eat meat. Does that make sense? Because if I still have a desire to eat meat, I'm going to eventually eat meat in the future anyway. Um, somebody's going to present it to me and I go, oh, yeah, okay. And, and, and I'm now compromising truth. But the reality is if the change happens in my heart, I will no longer eat meat. If I no longer eat meat, there's ten times less disruption to my environment. Automatically. Ten times less. As soon as I make that one choice. And, and I made that choice because I have a more loving heart, not because I think about it, but because God's love has transformed my heart enough for me to automatically choose to do that. In fact, so much so that when I eat something that's meat, I feel sick. And that's a good indication that I've made a choice or a change in my heart. And once that change is made in my heart, it's permanent. Once that change has been made, I've now destroyed the earth ten times less because it takes ten times more of the Earth's resources to produce uh, one kilogram of meat as it does to produce one kilogram of vegetables. And so I've automatically become ten times more environmentally conscious in that one action, just by my heart changing. And if I do that in all these other aspects, 
what will happen eventually is that we'll grow in love enough to design a car that's no longer polluting. Right? But what many of us are trying to do is design a car that's no longer polluting and not grow in love before we do it. And, and this is where we're back to front. We cannot hope to design a more loving car when we ourselves are less loving than what we're trying to design. And that's what we face. So if we first change our heart, now we have the capacity to understand how to design a more loving car. If we first become more in harmony with love ourselves in our actions, we now know what a loving car needs to do. And I feel we need to learn or we need to come to love the systems as they exist now. A lot of people that I see trying to change environmental issues or unloving issues in society are actually full of rage about those things mm -hmm. and while the rage is there um, they can even be like aiming for something more loving but the rage within them indicates that they that they haven't healed the hurt about this thing inside mm -hmm. of them and while they're in that state I feel they actually contribute to a lack of change also like the, and so it's it's actually loving this the situation that got us to have the diesel car that we have, like forgiving and repenting for everything that caused me to be in this situation will also open the way for change, I feel. Mm. But if we can't hope to develop more loving things in our environment while remaining unloving ourselves. And this is like a fallacy that people on earth have, that they feel that we can design something more loving while in our heart we remain unloving. What we need to do first is change ourselves. And in fact, if we look at it honestly, the only thing we can change is ourselves first. And once we change ourselves, then we have the capacity to learn about love and therefore learn about what a more loving thing to do is. And then we, of course, want to embrace that. So once we embrace that, our, our, our mind starts coming up with ideas that are more loving automatically. So I can think of 20 more loving things in a car at the moment and, and some of them I feel are scientifically feasible. Uh, but in the end, if we fully extend our love, we might not even need a car. Mm. We, we, we might be able to levitate objects and transport them without even needing wheels or a motorised system or anything. We don't know. I want to do the teleport with you. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, so you know, in the end, we've got to be careful that we don't think limited, uh, limit right. yeah. with our limits, our current limits. Remember, our current limits are, are established not by anything else. It's not 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 being established by intellect. It's by being established by our limitation to love. That's where our limits are. If if we extend this limit of of our love to a higher limit. Now we have the capacity to design things that are that amount of loving. And then when we increase that amount of loving to this amount of loving up here, then we'll be able to design things that are that amount of loving. Does that make sense? And as we're progressing, we're designing more and more loving things. So I don't think it's just a method, a way of sort of just saying, okay, we just give up all vehicles. What we need to understand is the reason why we have our current vehicles is because somebody in a certain condition of love designed it that way and we were incapable and still incapable of becoming more loving. Once we become more loving, then we're capable of designing a more loving car and a more loving home and a more loving food processing plant and a more loving manufacturing industry and a more and so forth. We're, we're capable of that once we're more loving. But if if we're not more loving, how can we design something that's more loving? We can't, because we don't understand how. Mm. So that's what I feel needs to happen. And one of the things I want to see happen with the learning centres is to have all of these principles sort of engaged, you know, in an active way. So that's what we're doing in Australia, and it's been really good, hasn't it, mm. Babe? Like mm -hmm. seeing the different learning centres starting to engage this process and starting to... Well, many of the teams, one of the main focus in the teams at the moment, the learning teams, is they, we're trying to help the learning teams become more loving. Mm. Because if they don't become more loving, they won't be able to do more loving things. Mm. You know? 
So the primary focus of each team is we engage in activity, such as like in, you know, planting some trees. And then what we're trying to do is we're watching the people while they're planting the trees. We're not watching what they're doing to the ground or all these other things. We're watching the people and their attitude and their feelings and what's going on and, we, and, how and how they interact with each other. And we're trying to help them refine the love they have for everything around them, including the trees and the plants, the soil and themselves and each other. And as we refine that, now they'll get to a point where they come up with some ideas about how to plant a tree that's more loving. Does that make sense? I saw a video of that. There's a lot of triggering going on. Yeah. <laughs> Why didn't you pick that up? Well, I did more than you, and <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it's just, and, and the more we try to embrace the concept that we need to become more loving before we can do more loving things, then our main goal in life will become will to be become more loving, not to discover the next fancy way of making a car. Mm -hmm. Because the reality is when we become more loving, we will automatically find the next fancy way to make a car that is going to be more loving. And cheaper. And cheaper <laughs> and more economical and yeah. less yeah. resources yeah. and and eventually we'll get to the point where we won't even need a car. We'll be so loving that we don't even need a car anymore and that we'll be able to transport ourselves and our family and all of our goods to the other side of the earth without needing a plane or a car or any other vehicle. No passports. You know? yeah. No passports, no passports, no check-in, no, check no, 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 no baggage claim, no anything, because we've become so loving that we've automatically found the way to do it. Do you imagine for the future, like, uh, soul unions happening and people just staying on the earth forever, not going to the spirit world? And they won't stay on the earth forever because they won't desire to. The, the reality is this dimension has the capacity to mirror other dimensions in the spirit world but in a lot, much slower manner. Mm -hmm. So because it's a physical dimension and everything's governed by genetics and genetic changes happen over time and things respond more slowly to change. In, this, in the higher dimensions of the spirit world you have very, very rapid response to your own change. And this is very enjoyable fact of life. Mm -hmm. So once you uh, have reached a certain condition of love yourself, you'll feel like, oh, I, don't, I don't want to feel bound to my body on earth anymore. I would like to you know, experience these dimensional existences where I can much more rapidly embrace my desires and passions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Should, we, should we have yeah. something? Should yeah. we eat? Yeah. Mm. We're going to do a channeling? Yeah, yeah. we're going to do a channeling. After, after eating? Yeah, yeah. I think you're right.